Lords and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think before I burst into the crowd, I'd, I'd just like to make a comment about um, the issue of closeness and, the, and, and the, the, how special this sort of gathering is. And, and I want to do that in the context of being a military man. And I think my, uh, my career in, in the UK military is similar to lots of people in the UK military in the terms of their involvement with the Gulf over their lives. And I first served in the, in the Gulf as a young officer in 1966 um, and had, I have to say, a fascinating period there. Some of my best memories were hunting with uh, Arab friends in a number of the countries there. Uh, you can't really mention hunting in this country now, it doesn't go down too well. Um, those are some of my fondest memories. And, uh, and over, uh, over, over uh, my whole career since then, I have constantly been involved with the, the Gulf region. And just picking some highlights, I would pick uh, 1980 when I was commanding a, a frigate. Uh, was one of the first ships in the Armada Patrol because of the risk to tank of that there. And then much more recently, as a number of you I, I know because I met you, I took uh, a carrier battle group at the end of 96 into the Gulf and also a, a carrier battle group of about 20 ships into the Gulf in, in early 97. Uh, and here I am now at this conference and it just is a continuum really and I think it's very, it's, that's a similar experience of a large number of our military officers across all three services. And I think it's, it, it, it reflects that very close relationship we have with, uh, with, with the GCC states. As far as today goes, I'm uh, really going to concentrate and make some comments on the military capabilities, um, both present and in the future, of Iran and Iran. Uh, but obviously, afterwards we'll be open to other questions, and uh, if you wish, we can broaden that a little more. First of all, uh, looking at Iraq, now, although Saddam Hussein chose to make a deal with the United Nations uh, when he realized the weight of force that he might have to face and is vocally disappointed uh, at this week's UNSCOM report, all of the information and intelligence I have seen suggests that Saddam Hussein is nevertheless reasonably pleased with the results of his latest act of brinkmanship. But the crisis over UNSCOM, which actually began last October, was different to all the earlier crises, which uh, all of you will realise is almost a, an annual event, in fact, since the Gulf War. And it was different in that there was no direct military threat made by Iraq. Its forces didn't threaten Kuwait or any other border. There was no attack on the Kurdish cities. There was no serious action against the no-fly zones. Saddam's choice of tactic on this occasion to undermine the UNSCOM was shrewd. We have very good reason to believe that he wanted to uh, use this tactic two years ago, in 1995. But the defection of uh, Hassan Kamil, which brought to us new revelations about Iraqi's uh, weapons of mass destruction, particularly his biological warfare program, meant that he had to wait a decent interval before he could use this tactic again. In fact, while coalition forces remain ready to support those in the region, I wonder whether Saddam has run short of military options. The most obvious ones have already been used. Sanctions have prevented Iraq from rebuilding its army and air force, but the regime has put considerable effort into flighting the embargo. We believe, in fact, that uh, funds which until now were spent on food ration are being increasingly diverted into military procurement. Much of this is spent on acquisition of spare parts, which has helped Iraq to maintain a surprising proportion of its tanks and combat aircraft. But there are signs of attempts to purchase complete pieces of equipment. A recent example, which we have hard intelligence of, is that of Tamara, which is an early warning radar tracking system. Uh, and he was willing and trying to buy this for a considerable amount of money. While we still judge that Iraq, that Iraq without the presence of Western forces, would be able to retake Kuwait, the accumulation of years of maintenance problems under a sanctions regime has taken its toll of Iraq's military capability. This is difficult to gauge with any accuracy. But to take one example, Iraq's sortie rate for combat aircraft have been on the decline in recent years. Given the importance, however, that Saddam puts on internal security, the same degree of deterioration is, is probably not the case with the uh, elite Republican Guard Force. If, as Saddam hopes, sanctions are dramatically loosened over the next year or so, how quickly could he rebuild his military capability? And what would be his priorities? His ground forces will be re-equipped and revitalized from the centre out. 
starting with the Special Security Organization and the Special Republican Guard. Throughout the conventional military sector, improvements in morale and logistics will be as important for him uh, as capability and serviceability of new equipment. Purchases of equipment are likely to include an element of technology transfer <coughs> to support a drive to be able to manufacture weapon systems in Iraq so that it will be less vulnerable to sanctions in the future. We can expect it will take at least two to three years, but probably longer, to rebuild Iraq's ground forces and air forces to the size similar to those in 1990. Saddam's effort at a great cost to preserve the remnants of his weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs indicates that these will also be a very high priority. The production of chemical warfare agents could be supported almost immediately by Iraq's civil chemical <coughs> industry, and production of biological warfare agents could take place within months. And we know he's done uh, weapon, uh, weaponeering of those, of those uh, types of agents. A robust monitoring regime remains crucial. We must also be alive to the possibility that ANSCOM might not be able to prevent some CBW production uh, of agents or weapons while they're there. Indeed, we assess Saddam has retained some hidden CBW stocks. Despite sanctions, since 1991, Iraq's missile production infrastructure has been largely rehabilitated. And through its development of the UN permitted Al Samud missile, the country's indigenous capabilities are now more advanced in technical terms than they were in 1990. Iraq is therefore well placed to work on more capable systems than the Al Samud. And if the UN restrictions were ended, the production of a 650 kilometer range Al Hussein ballistic missile uh, could be achieved within a year. Iraq could also utilize the technology of the 650 range systems to develop longer range missiles. Fitting these missiles with chemical and biological warfare warheads could be easily accomplished, but a nuclear weapon would be at least five years away. This is assuming, as I say, no checks to income. Overall, there will be a drive to re-establish the military capability of Iraq's ground and air forces as amongst the most powerful in the Arab world. And, our, and Saddam, of course, sees weapons of mass destruction uh, as a badge of power and position, and he has already, as we mentioned a couple of times, shown a willingness to use them not just on another country, but also on his own people. Moving now on to Iran. In Iran, the prospect of political change has rightly become more eye-catching than military developments over the last year. And this might suggest that support for terrorism will be reduced. It also makes it ever more important to distinguish, as the intelligence analyst always must, between intention and capability. As Field Marshal Inge emphasized yesterday. But in the short time left, I'd like to mention three aspects of Iran's capability we monitor closely. Without enough money to afford all its military dreams, and for the time being with a reduced threat from Iraq, Iran has chosen to concentrate on these areas for the last five years. The first is uh, sometimes and rather grandly called asymmetric warfare. This does not simply mean that opposing sides in a conflict are different in size and capability, as we discussed yesterday. Iran knows that it cannot fight normal battles against the combined forces of the GCC and its Western allies. It has therefore developed a range of other disruptive op options which raise military risks and costs to anyone who opposes Tehran. This means a capability to mount a blockade of the Gulf, to mine it, to use very small boats for hit and run maritime attacks, to fire missiles and even weapons of mass destruction on countries in range of its 500 kilometer Scud Sea missiles. And lastly, to use terrorism, either by conducting terrorist operations or supporting dissident groups in the region. When Khamenei threatened to respond to a feared US attack after al Qaeda, these were the sorts of things being hinted at. They may be effective as a response and even more so as an attempt. The second area which Iran has spent a lot of money on since 1989 is the growth of its navy. Three kilo-class submarines from Russia, along with patrol boats and anti-ship cruise missiles from China, are the well-known headline items of a drive to increase naval capability. To do what? 
It seems to us that Iran's immediate purpose is not to threaten directly the countries of the GCC. Rather, it seeks a capability preeminent in the region to influence, control, and threaten maritime activity in the Gulf. As mentioned earlier, for example, it wants to be able to threaten closure of the Gulf and is adding a variety of means to do so. Now, is this possible? This is a very complex issue, and we don't have enough time, or not at the moment, I may be helping with questions. But imagine the consequences, if only on insurance rates in the oil market, if Iran merely announced the closure of and controlled access through the Straits of Hormuz. It could back it with mines, and it has a, a comprehensive uh, stockpile of some very capable mines, and cruise missiles on sea, air, and land. Yes, uh, we could clear the Straits with an international force, indeed we looked at options of how we'd achieve that, but the cost would be high, and it's the capability to do this, as much as the actually doing it, which gives Iran the status it seeks in the region. Finally, I would like to mention weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles. Iran has ratified the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, outlawing biological weapons. While there is no firm evidence linking Iran's procurement to a biological warfare program, we believe Iran retains an active interest in biotechnological cap capabilities which have dual-use potential. Equally, though Iran sought chemical weapons primarily as a response to their use by Iraq, Iran's program has continued to develop since the late 1980s. Iran has also ratified the, chem the Chemical Weapons Convention, of course. Despite this, we judge that Iran will try to retain a capability for the rapid production of agents and weapons and their means of delivery. It is probably working on chemical warheads for its ballistic missiles, for example. Iran already has hundreds of scud type ballistic missiles at between 300 and 500 kilometers range, which has deployed in the past and is developing a capability to build these missiles for itself. They are also developing longer range missiles which potentially could be used to threaten the entire region. And these are likely to appear in the next few years. On the other hand, we do not believe that Iran is close to getting a nuclear weapon. This is likely to take some 10 years, although, of course, these timescales can always be shortened if substantial help is provided by someone else. I think in conclusion, for both Iran and Iraq, regardless of political rapprochements and economic difficulties, Retaining a powerful armed force will remain a priority. This is in part a product of internal security concerns, but more importantly underpinned by the claims of each to regional leadership. Superimposed on this are the perceptions of each relating to Israel and the defensive role of, of Western, in particular US forces in the region. As a consequence, any arms race between the two is coloured by reasons other than simple mutual rivalry. Because of these extra concerns, as well as the lessons learned from the Iran-Iraq war, deterrence will feature considerably in their weapons programs and arms procurement. This can be projected uh, through conventional means, Iran's build-up and the Gulf being a case in point. But more worrying is the greater importance which both are attaching to unconventional weapons, which are less easy to detect despite international monitoring measures. The difficulty for the GCC and for the Western forces trying to protect it is deciphering where capability is intended as deterrence or a threat. Mistaking one for the other, as we have seen, can have a devastating effect. I'd like to hand over to you.